Then fortune brought about a rapid change in the situation, banishing all thought and all discussion of love, and events took quite a different turn. A report came to the king that a major rebellion in Egypt, the Egyptians, he learned, had murdered the royal satrap and elected a king from among themselves. He had marched out from Memphis and passed through the Pelusium. He was already overrunning Syria and Phoenicia to the point where their cities were offering no more resistance. It was as though a river in spate or a fire had suddenly assailed them. The king was thrown into panic by this report, and the Persians were terror-stricken. A deep gloom settled over the whole of Babylon. Then the gossips and seers began to maintain that the king's dream had foretold the future. By demanding a sacrifice, they said, the gods were foretelling danger but also victory. The usual speeches were made, and the usual measures were taken. Everything you would expect when war breaks out suddenly. All Asia, indeed, was in a ferment. Thus, the king called together the Persian peers and all the heads of the constituent nations who were in Babylon, men with whom he habitually discussed important questions and considered the situation that had arisen. They all had different suggestions, but everybody agreed that urgent measures were necessary and there should be no delay, not even a day if possible. There were two reasons for this. To check the growth of the enemy's power and to revive their friends' spirits by showing them that help was at hand. If they delayed, on the other hand, the opposite would happen in every respect. The enemy would think they were afraid and would hold them in contempt, and their own side would think they were being neglected and would give in. It was very lucky for the king that the news had reached him in Babylon, near to Syria, rather than in Bactra or Ekbatana, since he had only to cross the Euphrates to come to grips with the rebels. So he decided to march out with the troops already at hand, and to send the order throughout his empire for the army to gather at the river Euphrates. Persia can mobilize its forces very easily. The system has been in force since the time of Cyrus, the first king of Persia. It is established which nations have to supply cavalry for a war and how many, which are to supply infantry and how many, who is to supply archers, which how many chariots each people is to supply, both ordinary and scythe, where elephants are to come from, and how many, and from whom money is to come, in what currency, and how much. Everybody participates in these preparations, and they take no more time than one man takes to get ready. The king marched out from Babylon on the fifth day after this proclamation. There was a general order for all men of military age to follow him. Dionysius was among them. He was an Ionian, and none of the king's subjects was allowed to stay behind. He armed himself magnificently and formed a by no means negligible company from his own followers. He stationed himself in a conspicuous position in the front ranks. It was clear that he would distinguish himself. He had an ambitious nature and did not consider courage a uh, merely secondary virtue. On the contrary, he esteemed it one of the noblest. Furthermore, on this occasion, he had also had some slight hope that if he showed himself useful in the war, the king would give him Calarho as a reward for his valorous service, even without making a decision in the case. As for Calarho, the queen did not want her to be taken along, for that reason, she did not even mention her to the king or ask what he wanted done with the foreign woman. Artaxates, too, kept his peace. His excuse was that now that his master was in a dangerous situation, he did not dare remind him of an amorous dalliance. But the truth was that he was glad to be rid of her, as he would have be of a wild beast. In fact, I rather think he was actually grateful to the war, 
for having broken this passionate attachment on the king's part. It was feeling, feeding on lack of occupation, but the king had no, by no means forgotten Callerho. The recollection of her beauty came back to him even in that indescribable confusion, but he was too embarrassed to mention her. He did not want to be thought altogether adolescent, thinking of a pretty girl in the middle of a war like that. Still, his impulses made themselves felt. He did not say anything to Statira herself, or even to the eunuch, since he, knew about, since he knew about his love. But he devised the following plan. It is customary for the king himself and the Persian nobility, when they go off to war, to take along with them their wives and children, and gold and silver, and clothing and eunuchs, and concubines and dogs, and dining room furniture, and their costly treasures and luxuries. So he summoned the man in charge of all this. After much preliminary talk, and first giving instructions for the disposition of everything, he ended up by mentioning Callerho with a well-counterfeited expression meant to convey that it did not matter to him. Oh, he said, that foreign girl whose case I undertook to judge, she can come along with the other women. And so Callerho left Babylon, not to her displeasure, because she thought that Charius would be leaving too. Now, she thought, war brings many unforeseeable events in its train, including improvement in the fortunes of those in distress. So perhaps peace would soon be concluded and bring with it an end to the trial.